By now you've watched Philip and John's videos and you've got some idea about your experimental driver inventory as well as have thought a bit about experimental design. Now we're going to delve into experimental design a little bit more deeply and think about why it matters. A good experimental design will give you the ability to answer your question, maximize information, know and be able to defend your assumptions, reduce costs and more wisely allocate limited resources, get published, avoid catastrophe. First, let's talk statistical terminology. A factor is a variable that you plan on manipulating. In experiments examining changing ocean systems, we often refer to factors as drivers. So in John's three-factor experiment, he manipulated PCO2, salinity, and temperature. Levels are the values of a factor that will be applied during an experiment. For example, PCO2 might be set to past, present, and future levels. Treatments are the combination of factors at different levels that we actually apply during the experiment. For example, when John presented his major vectors scenario, every culture flask represents a treatment. The number of treatments you have will play a big part how much effort or cost your experiment takes. So if you're going to do an experiment with a lot of treatments, you want to make sure you have a good reason why. What we want is an experiment that is as simple as it can be to answer the question we want, but no simpler. An experimental unit is the primary unit of analysis. This might not sound very well defined because it isn't. You'd be surprised how much time statisticians think, spend thinking about what exactly is N. It's kind of why we're the life of the party. It also leads us to think about replication at different levels and the related issue of pseudo-replication. Many global change studies involve replication at more than one level. For example, a culture tank study where you have a header tank controlling many culture tanks below it has two levels of replication. If this is ignored in the analysis, that's when pseudo-replication comes in. If you want to find out more about pseudo-replication, we'd refer you to the paper by Cornwall and Hurd in ISIS Journal of Marine Science. So why do we care about all of this? Well, we want to design an experiment that minimizes the effort and maximizes the information we get. But we also need to be realistic about what we can achieve. For example, you might want to do four levels of temperature, representative of, say, now, the future in the year 2100, and a couple of points in between in order to get some kind of a response norm. But you have a limited number of replicates means, it might mean that your noise is overwhelming the signal and that difference across treatments. While we may be tempted to draw a curve that looks like this, we could equally draw some other curves like these. But Let's say we cut it down to only two treatments, now in the year 2100. That gives us twice as many replicates in each treatment. By having more replicates, we may be able to get a useful answer where before we didn't have enough information to say anything useful at all. So we need to be clear about how much noise we have as well as what kind of signal we're expecting. Let's take these ideas and jump right into one of the experiments John talked about. The scenario. This is a really good design if we want to just know what's happening between, say, now and the future, or two points in time. It's efficient, but remember we'll gain very little information outside of those two points. So we won't get a response norm or any, any detail like that, but we will be able to say what's going on now versus the future. Because it's a nice simple setup, this is also a good chance to talk a little bit more about some statistical details that are relevant in the other studies as well. Let's start by generating some data. We'll assume we are looking at now versus the future and that we are measuring the growth rate of our organism. Let's say our experimental results look like this. Let's also assume these points are independent. If they aren't, what we think is a now versus future effect 
might just be a refrigerator by the window versus refrigerator by the door effect. How would we analyze this data? First, we need to remind ourselves of the original question. It might be, is there a difference between now and the future? Well, yes, there is. If we were smart about what experiment we're looking at, we're probably pretty sure there is a difference between now and the future. The more interesting question is, what is that difference? We've looked at a lot of previous work before we've started our experiment, and so we have a good idea that there's going to be a difference. A hypothesis testing framework, i.e. looking at p-values, is probably not what we want to do. It's not very interesting. It might not even be appropriate. If we know beforehand that the null hypothesis couldn't be true, then testing it isn't a good idea. This leads us to something that statisticians are generally quite concerned with, which is an over-reliance on p-values. Instead, we are much more interested in estimation and interpretation. So if we're comparing now versus future, we can think about estimation and interpretation like this. First, we want to measure the difference in means of our two treatments. Zero is where there is no difference. We can also usually think of a value that, while different from zero, is ignorable from a biological point of view, but where values beyond that range start to become interesting. So let's look at four different point estimates and confidence intervals for that difference, which represent four possible experimental outcomes. Notice the first two would return non-significant results if we were performing a hypothesis test, while the second two would return significant results. But the confidence intervals tell us much, much more. The first interval lets us know that the difference is positive, negative, or non-existent. But regardless, the effect is not important. The second interval lets us know that we probably didn't design our study very well. Not only do we not know if our result is positive or negative, we don't know if it's ignorable or important. This is a good reason why you want to do power calculations before you do an experiment or pilot studies if you need to. But sometimes, even if you do those, you can be unlucky. The initial estimates you put into your power calculation might have been wrong, or you just happen to get a really weird data set. When we get to the third interval, we know that there's a positive effect, but it's small enough that we've determined that it's not really that important. The fourth interval is the sort of thing that gets people excited. We have a positive effect, and we know it's of an important magnitude. So instead of simply doing a t-test and asking if there is a difference, let's look at a better question. What is the difference between now and the future? How am I going to measure it? Is that difference important? Let's make the scenario a little more exciting. By adding three more treatments to our scenario experiment, we have a chance at seeing the shape of the response curve. However, biology is messy, and depending on how much variability we have and how many replicates we have, we may or may not be able to see that shape. This is where the metal simulator can really help. Have a play with it and see if the data you might get is going to help you answer the questions you want. You may have noted the extreme values we chose for our five-point scenario are outside of the conditions we are most interested in now in 2100. This allows us to test extremes, providing more statistical power overall. Particularly, you may be looking for some kind of tipping point, local maxima or minima, that may happen well into the future. Analyzing this data may be a bit more complex than our two-scenario approach. Once you collect your data, you have a few options. You could simply analyze each treatment level independently, as you would in an ANOVA, or you might want to decide to fit the response to a curve, maybe a straight line, maybe a quadratic, or some kind of smoother like a GAM to describe your gradient. Your analysis approach will depend on the questions you want to answer. It will also determine how many replicates you need and what sorts of assumptions you're making. Again, this is where the metal simulator can really come in handy. You can try different ideas, generate some data, see if you can analyze that data, and see if it answers the question you're trying to answer.
Remember, a little bit of time spent simulating can save you a lot of time in the lab. And now for something completely different. At the other end of the complexity scale, we've got the full factorial design. Full factorials are good for examining all details when resources are unlimited. That is, you can look at main effects, two-way interactions, three-way interactions, and so on. But they get ridiculously complicated very quickly. If you have a full factorial, you can still do projections for now versus the future. However, your projections are no more accurate than if you just did the scenario with two levels, now and the future. So if you think about that, what that means is, say you've got three factors, two levels for each factor, eight treatments. And if you've got five replicates per treatment, you've got a total of 40 replicates needed for a full factorial. If you're doing the two scenario, you get the same level of precision with only 10 replicates. Now let's talk about the collapse factorial. The collapse factorial is a good design when you have one factor that you're most interested in, say a dominant factor, and a number of other factors that you collapse all together into one combined factor. Collapse factorials are good for projections and also give you some mechanistic understanding. For example, it can provide information about whether the putative dominant factor is actually dominant, whether the combined effect of other factors and their interactions with each other are important, some information about the interaction between the dominant factor and other factors. This is a good design if you have a limited number of experimental units, but you still want to get some separation between a dominant factor and all of the other factors. You have to accept that the other factors will all be confounded with each other. So the information you get is a little bit limited. However, you may have some other tools up your sleeve, like proteomics, that can help tease apart some of those other effects. Next, let's talk about major vectors. Major vectors allow you to look at the individual factors as well as their combined effect. You would likely analyze each of the different vectors separately. So for John's example, we'd look at the following. Each of the three main effects to get individual response norms, and then we'd look at the diagonal to get the scenario design. One of the main take-home points is that there is no single right answer for what experimental design to use. You'll want to think about what question you really want to answer and which design is going to work best for you within the resources you have. For example, as we can see in the table, if you want to look at a three-factor full factorial study, and you need five replicates to have enough power, even two treatment levels per driver requires 40 experimental units. With a similar number of experimental units, you could consider a scenario with eight treatment levels and five replicates, or a collapse factorial with 12 replicates and 12 treatment levels. Another way to look at it is that you may, for example, only have 24 culture tanks. So unless you replicate in time, you'll be constrained by the approaches available to you. Remember, you don't need to answer every interesting question in one experiment. It's much better to answer one question well than a bunch of questions badly. You're probably here because you've got a really interesting question you want to answer. Expect that it will be complex and difficult to answer, and it's going to be a huge time investment. So the more planning you do up front, the more likely you're going to be happy at the end. Some things I recommend are know how you're going to analyze your data before you begin your experiment. If you have enough information to perform a power calculation, you should do so. Simulate data and analyze your simulated data. Remember, your real data is almost never going to be as good as your simulated data. So if you can't analyze your simulated data and answer the question you want to answer, you'll be in serious trouble when you get to the real data. Use the results from your first simulation as a chance to refine your question and redesign your experiment. Small pilot studies are your friend. You'll learn how your data will behave. For example, should you be operating on a log scale or a linear scale? You'll also get a better idea about the level of noise you can expect and how many replicates you'll need.
For designs that don't have many treatment levels, it's great to have a few extra replicates. Sometimes strange things happen and you might lose a culture, or you might actually find out something really interesting. If you have the need and opportunity to, to consult with a statistician or a senior scientist who knows some stats, you want to do this before the experiment. Finally, be brave and don't be afraid to try something new. That's what's going to make your experiment really exciting to everyone else.